Dear all, welcome to Anamed Library Talk. Uh, at today's talk, we have distinguished speakers uh, with us, Daphne Pena and Zachary Cheatwood. Uh, today's talk is enti entitled A Source Book on Byzantine Law, uh, illustrating Byzantine law through the sources. Uh, this is the first book in English, providing a wide uh, range of Byzantine legal sources. Uh, in six chapters, this book explains and il illustrates Byzantine law through a selection of fundamental Byzantine legal sources, beginning with the sources before uh, the time of uh, Justinian and extending up to AD uh, 1453. For all sources, English translations are uh, provided next to the original Greek and Latin text. In some cases, tables uh, or other features are included uh, that help further elucidate the source and illustrate its nature. Uh, the vol volume offers a clear yet detailed primer to Byzantine law, its sources and its uh, significance. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce you our speakers. Uh, Daphne Pena uh, is assistant professor uh, in legal history at the University of Groningen. Uh, Pena studied law at the University of uh, Athens in Greece, where she completed her master's in legal history uh, in 12th in 2003. In the year of 2012, she defended and published her thesis on the Byzantine Imperial Acts to Venice, Pisa, and Genoa, 10th and 12th centuries, and a comparative uh, legal study, 11 International Publishing. Uh, in 2022, together with Measuring, she published a source book on Byzantine law, illustrating Byzantine law through the sources um, from the Brill. Uh, her res uh, research in interests lie in Roman and Byzantine law, and especially in their influence on the European legal tradition. Uh, she has published extensively on this area uh, in the uh, in the some uh, publisher houses with uh, such as Brill, Cambridge University Press, Palgrave, Macmillan, uh, Taylor and Francis, and Dossier, and uh, Zachary Chitwood as the principal investigator uh, for Mamens. Uh, uh, Doctor Chitwood is responsible for the implementation of the project. Uh, in addition, he also is uh, evaluating the copious surviving material in medieval. Uh, Greek connected with Mount Athos. After completing his PhD at Princeton University, he was the resident Byzantinist on the ERC starting grant uh, founded Foundations in Medieval uh, Societies, Cross-Cultural Comparisons. Since 2016, he has been a lecturer in Byzantine studies at the Johannes uh, Gutenberg University of Mainz, and where he is currently completing his second dissertation or habit habitation uh, on memoria in the Byzantine world. His main research in interests uh, include Byzantine law and monasticism. Uh, Dr. Cheatwood is also co-founder and editor-in-chief of the interdisciplinary journal Endowment Studies uh, from Brill uh, from 2016. And the attendees, uh, please bear in mind that your video and audios are closed. Uh, please type your questions in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in the Q&A session at the end. And uh, now I'm passing the word to Zachary Chitwood. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, so many thanks um, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, I, I will very briefly um, introduce the book's authors um, and the text itself. Uh, and then Daphne will give a more thorough presentation of the material in the book. Um, However, I don't want to repeat uh, what's just been said, um, and there was already a fairly thorough um, uh, biography of Daphne Pena that was given. However, I would also just like to briefly mention the co-author, uh, Rose Meyering, um, who you could say is, um, is Daphne's uh, predecessor as university lecturer, um, specializing in Byzantine law at the Department of Legal History in Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, and she, 
has published very uh, widely um, on Byzantine uh, legal texts, including editing uh, quite a number of, um, of texts. Um, uh, at this point, I would just like to say a little bit uh, about the book. Um, as was already said, this is a very um, this this book actually fills a large gap, a large lacuna in the scholarship, because there isn't a source book of this sort that collects together um, Byzantine legal texts and contextualizes them and explains them. Um, not only in English, but I would argue in in any language. I mean, there are scattered translations of things like crucibles um, and uh, legal texts here and there, but a complete collection such as, uh, as this from uh, taking text from all the Byzantine history um, is a novum. Um, and uh, Daphne and uh, Rose should be, um, yes, much uh, congratulated on that. Um, uh, just one other thing uh, I'll maybe say about the book before Daphne goes into greater detail about it is uh, one thing that I noticed um, uh, upon reading it is that uh, the book uh, very much grew out of the classroom. Um, and that's emphasized in the preface as well, um, that um, uh, uh, uh, Rose uh, Meyering uh, had been teaching um, a seminar in Byzantine law in Groningen from 1990 to 2007, 2008. Um, and from that time onward until her retirement, um, in 2017, she was joined by uh, Daphne, where they taught the course together. Um, and I would just like to say to the audience that um, a university or institution of any sort that offers courses in Byzantine law is um, exceptional worldwide. In fact, this is Groningen is the only place I know of outside of Greece uh, where you can take courses on, on Byzantine law. Uh, Daphne can uh, correct me uh, if there are, if there are others I don't know about, maybe in Italy. Um, so you can definitely tell by the book that this is uh, material that has been um, used in a classroom context, um, explanations that are understandable enough that an undergraduate student um, can, uh, can, can understand them, but also um, a lot of uh, detail that you would expect from experts on Byzantine law, uh, as uh, uh, Daphne Pennant and uh, Rose Meyering are. Um, and with that, I think uh, you could say, to use a Byzantine uh, design legal designation, um, that the two authors are kind of ante casores. They're, um, they're modern day uh, Byzantine jurists explaining these complex, sometimes arcane texts. Um, and with that, I will let uh, Daphne introduce the book. Zachary, thank you very much for the kind words and this introduction. Um, Rose is not here, and indeed, uh, she's my, uh, well, she, she, it, it, this book grew uh, out of the classroom, as you said. I'll say a few things about this. Um, in fact, before we go into the talk and the questions, that was the idea. I was thinking of saying a few words how about the book in general and explain why we wrote this book in the first place. Um, as Zachary mentioned, um, well, um, there was not uh, a similar book up to now. What uh, we have is, of course, and anyone who uh, begins with Byzantine law should know this, um, there is the Greek book by Spiros Troianos, Epiges to Byzantinu Dikeu, which was revised and edited in Athens in 2011. Uh, it remains indispensable. And this book was uh, translated into Italian in 2015 by Pierangelo Buongiorno. And two years later, in 2017, Dieter Simon and Silvia Neye translated it into German and brought its bibliographical references and indexes up to date. Uh, so this is a basic book. And we also have an older book, the what you see on the screen, the Historia Juris Greco Romani Delineatio, about by, by Byzantine legal sources written in French by uh, Jan Lokin and Nico van der Waal. Um, these are the, uh, well, also undecessors. These are the, the real undecessors from Groningen, together with Bernard Stolte and the later younger generation. Um, and this book remains also uh, valuable despite uh, its date 
published in it was published in Groningen in 1985. So in short, a Byzantine or a student of Byzantine law has sufficient and excellent material that will help him to learn about or investigate the sources of Byzantine law. So why then this book? Why write this book? As Zahari said, our book um, derives from the classroom. It was born from our teaching experience. Um, as he mentioned, after, uh, uh, well, Rose Meyering was uh, teaching this uh, uh, course um, in Groningen. She, in 1990, she had taken it over from Jan Lokin. And from that, uh, and from the year 2007, Meyering and I started teaching the course together. And following her retirement in 2017, I'm teaching it on my own having from time to time uh, the help of my two dear colleagues, Tom van Bochhoff and Fritz Brandsma. Um, so the core of the present book is based on the so-called uh, source book that Meyering and I have used in class all these years. This source book consisted of fragments of sources of Byzantine law, which Meyering had selected and uh, had translated throughout the years and in the later states a few sources were also added by myself. For many years, I had been thinking of using this source book and uh, as a core of a book. When, uh, in, in the year 2020, when the lives of all of us changed because of the pandemic, I decided it was high time to do uh, this, to begin this project, and Rose once again helped me throughout the process. So what I did is using my hearing selection of Greek sources as a base, I started writing a theoretical text, an introduction to accompany these sources, which would provide something like a basic background to help the reader understand the source under discussion and its relationship to other Byzantine sources. And in some cases, I expanded the text and made additions to the sources, and the result is the book you have uh, you, we present today. Our book, and I'd like to emphasize on this, is not intended to provide a thorough uh, discussion on the sources of Byzantine law, nor is it a textbook about Byzantine law in general. Rather, the purpose of this book is to explain and illustrate Byzantine law through some basic legal sources. So it provides a selection of sources drawn from across the timeline of Byzantine law, and it is by no means exhaustive. It um, begins with the sources before the time of Justinian and ends in 1453. Byzantine law, of course, continues even after 1453, but in this book, we do not address post-1453 uh, 1453 Byzantine legal sources. The book is divided into six chapters, as you see on your screen. And the reader will notice that some chapters are much lengthier, lengthier than others. For example, so here you have the six chapters. Um, but if you see the um, second chapter, for example, is, a is rather a lengthy chapter because it deals with the legislation of Justinian. Um, and as you know, just for the legislation of Justinian forms the backbone of most later Byzantine legislation. Um, you also see that this chapter has the new curriculum of legal studies, uh, the teaching of law during this period, which is important. And in this chapter, we have detailed examples of the teaching of the antecessors, the law professors at the time of Justinian. Um, I'll give you some examples. Um, here you can see examples of um, explaining antecessorian writings. Um, here's an example by uh, Thaleleus, one of the law professors at the time of Justinian. So here you can see that we have the Greek fragment, uh, the uh, English translation, and on the side, on the left, we have explanations of um, what we see in their teaching, something that we already um, describe in, in the in, in the in, in this in the introduction in this chapter so what i'm trying to say is we use tables to illustrate um, um, the theory that we give um, there are some other uh, this is an example another example by uh, of an antecessor uh, stephanos it's here an example of erotopocrisis a uh, question and uh, answer example and i think we have uh, more the reader will 
Oh, and um, so we have six chapters. The second chapter is rather lengthy because it was about Justinian and Justinianic law remains important throughout uh, all the period of the Byzantine law. The last chapter, the canon law chapter is rather small um, and it offers a very, very brief selection of Byzantine uh, sources of canon law. The reader will also notice that a big part of the book deals with research that is being done in Groningen, namely the Basilica text and Scholia old and new. Um, this is something that began with uh, Professor Scheltema uh, and the edition of the Basilica uh, of uh, Scheltema, van der Waal and Holverda. It continued with uh, Jan Lokin and Bernard Stolte. Uh, and uh, we hope that we, um, well, we step uh, on there. Um, we continue this tradition as, as much as we can. So um, this is something that we also took care in this book, um, uh, dealing with research that is being done uh, in our university. So um, as you know, the text of the Basilica, it's divided into 60 books, and it is the Greek version of the mainly Latin Corpus Juris Civilis, issued in the sixth century by Emperor Justinian. And the Basilica text and scholia uh, are uh, our richest source of knowledge of Byzantine law. So uh, in our book, we discuss and explain all kinds of issues that are related to the Basilica and the Groningen edition of the Basilica. For example, the layout of the Basilica Groningen edition. Here's an example. Um, or um, how to cite a Basilica scholion. Um, and why this is the best way. Um, so some practical stuff that, that uh, will help uh, a scholar uh, understand uh, basic things. Um, in some cases, we also provide tables. Oh, here's, for example, um, uh, a chapter on recognizing all the new Basilica Scholia. Um, or uh, here, another example explaining reconstruction of a lost Basilica text uh, by the editors, how it's is, how is being done by the editors and which is the text that they used for the reconstruction. So as I said, uh, we have a lot of uh, information about that in the book. In some cases, we provide tables, schematic approaches to the sources and other features that may help further uh, elucidate the source and understand its nature and relationship to other sources. As far as the language is concerned, we have tried to use a simple language. Um, at many points, the reader will also notice some patterns of classroom teaching, uh, a bit of antecessorian teaching to use a Byzantine term. For example, sometimes we provide theory in advance, a protheoria or a legal commentary, or we point out special characteristics of a source that should help the reader better understand the material. We also decided not to include many footnotes in the text because it will become heavy. So we decided after um, every uh, chapter to have a basic select bibliography. Um, so if someone wants to continue, uh, he can uh, consult this bibliography, um, which he will find at the end of every uh, section. I also like to, no to note that at the final stage of this book, we had considerable help from Emeritus Professor Bernard Stolte and Dr. Mario Standalos, and we would like to thank both of them. Some, we thank both of them also in the preface. And last but not least, uh, the book is dedicated to the memory of Professor Jan Lokin, who passed away uh, during the very uh, last phase of this book uh, last year in uh, Groningen. Jan Lokin was professor of Roman law at the University of Groningen from 1977 until 2009 and will be always remembered as the real soul and pater familias of our uh, section. To sum up, and I will end with this, um, why? what is special about this book, if you want to sum this up? One, it's the first book in English providing a wide range of Byzantine legal sources. It's written in a simple language, not just for experts. Um, it's a tool that can help a student of Byzantine law or anyone who is interested in Byzantine law to find out what, on this, what's, what, of, what some of the sources actually look like and provide information about their basic background. And number two, what is also special about the book is that it connects to the long tradition of education and research into Byzantine law in Groningen, which we still try to continue. 
actually we thought it would be it would have been a pity not to use all this material that we have been collecting and teaching for so many years and to put down in writing our lectures and our experience so this book encapsulates the teaching of Byzantine law here in Groningen for more than 33 years we hope and that is the, the desideratum we hope that the book will raise interest in Byzantine law Thank you for your attention, for the presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions. So I will give the floor back to uh, Zachary now. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the for that overview of the book. And just to uh, briefly um, uh, discuss the format that we will now use uh, for the discussion, I will ask uh, just one or two brief questions. And then I will open up the floor to uh, the audience. And um, as was said at the beginning, please uh, type your question in the chat. Or if you would like to ask a question, you can type question into the chat and I'll put you at the top of our list. Um, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Uh, my first question is actually, uh, it has to, it concerns your own area of expertise. Um, and as you see behind me, this is a, a, a crucible of um, Alexius III of Trebizond, so one of the Grand Komneni. It's a crucible for um, for Dionysiou Monastery in Mount Athos. I work a lot with Mount Athos. Um, and uh, my question about the source book is, uh, because you've also worked with crucibles, especially for the uh, Western uh, Italian uh, city-states, um, uh, I was I was curious, um, I, I'm not sure if you had a crucible in the collection. And could you say something about are crucibles also part of Byzantine law? Should they be in a different source book? Uh, why why don't you have um, sort of these um, a documentary texts from, say, the Byzantine emperor or something like that? Um, well, I have to say that the answer is rather uh, disappointing. <laughs> it has to do with limitations. I mean, you're right. Um, at some point, we have to we have to make some choices about what we will include and what not. So again, this is based on our teaching. Uh, this is the sources that we used for our teaching. Uh, we haven't used, um, for example, we haven't used indeed uh, monastic documents. We haven't used um, even the uh, the act of the patriarchate. Uh, we mentioned it, but we haven't used it. Uh, there is a lot of material, but it was too much to put everything right now in the first edition. Uh, I hope at some point that we will revise the edition. I hope at some point that we will include more sources, but at some point we have to put a full stop. And as I said, we mainly uh, focused here also on the research that's being done in, in Groningen. Well, my PhD well had to do also with crucibles, but um, we didn't want to... to uh, extent to to ever, all kinds of sources but that that's uh, something for certainly to to do in the future uh having this as a base and adding more sources and and of course there are there are more fragments that you could use but for this book we had to limit ourselves and this goes uh you i also mentioned that canon law is also rather short um um, we only provide an um, a kind of overview of byzantine canon law and explain some basic terms um we do not uh, um, uh, go into detail into canon law um but i think well this is this is the this is the answer so it doesn't have to do with thinking something oh this can go in another book or it deals with um that we restrict it into for example um, um material coming from law books that was not the idea um it's just it happened to be the material that we taught for the for the for the course, so it was rather practical. So it was a practical reason actually. But who knows? In the future, it will be good to add more sources for sure. No, it has to be said. Uh, it's kind of an unfair question, you know. I'm asking you about something you you didn't include in your book because it's a again. Yeah. I want to emphasize that it's a great book, and particularly for the for the Basilica, it's uh, I think really fantastic because the Scolia. Are very difficult to read uh i think for specialists as well as non-specialists and you've really done um a, a great job of introducing this legal material and in terms of um of peer volume uh most of what we have in, in, of, of uh, byzantine legal texts is actually these 
the Basilica and the commentary tradition, 17 volumes in the Groningen edition, right? Um, yeah. So. And, and again, this is what we also wanted to, because our research has dealt with, with well, with the edition of, of uh, Scheltema. Uh, and van der Waal and Holverda. So that was the book is also based is also has to do a lot with the research that is that is being done in our uh, university. But you're right, and yeah, personally, I would have liked uh, to include some more fragments. But uh, in order to do that, you need more time. You have to study again. So at some point, you have to put a full stop and just publish the book. Otherwise, it will continue forever. But it's worth doing this in a second edition, perhaps. Yeah. So I, I have a um, another question, um, and it's it's not one of the pre-circulated questions, but I, I hope that it's um, one you can answer because it's something you brought up and I didn't really think about until now. Is um, this question of there not being a, a textbook on Byzantine law? Um, because uh, what we have, if you want to look up, um, let's say you're interested in Byzantine property law or something like that, mm. then I think the first step, uh, even nowadays, is to look up. Um, Carl Edward Zachariah von Liegenthal, his history of, of, of Greco-Roman law, as he called it. And the third edition is from 1892. So, you know, it's very old, uh, but that's still the most comprehensive overview we have um, for subjects within uh, Byzantine law, sort of a, a textbook of Byzantine law. Uh, do, do you guys have plans in Horningen, perhaps at some point in the future, maybe as a, as a companion to the source book to to mm -hmm. write something like a, a textbook of Byzantine law, a, a thematically organized, something like that? Um, not directly. I haven't discussed this with colleagues. Perhaps I should add to this that Troyanos has a, published some years ago um, a, a book called, uh, it's rather a short book, Isigisis of Zadinudike, which is, it, it has this structure and it's mainly based on different articles of his structured in property law, uh, law of obligations. And mm -hmm. uh, here and there, there are some articles about this, like um, Stolte has written something about Byzantine law of obligations and an article, now that I'm thinking about it. But uh, I, I haven't had any direct, uh, we haven't thought about it. But again, that's also a good idea. But that's really something difficult. I mean, that, that's, that's something um, um, we do not have it. We still go to Zaharia for it. Uh, uh, but if we decide to do this, it will take many, many years. But uh, we do not have any uh, plans for the near future to uh, for this. But yeah, that, that's also a nice idea. You come up with all nice ideas, Zaharia. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, and perhaps one last question before we open up um, the, the floor to everyone else is uh, because this is an online talk, but it is at the Animate Center in Istanbul, uh, technically. Um, and I was just wondering uh, what you think, um, on the basis of this book as well, uh, as a Byzantine legal scholar, someone who works on Byzantine law, it's usually grouped together with the Roman legal tradition. So in the West, so the use commune, the rediscovery of Roman law in Northern Italy in the 11th century, mm. and then from there, uh, developing in, in Western Central Europe. Um, you, you do you do have, of course, Byzantine law studies in the Slavic world, so say Russia, Serbia, something like that. Um, but usually there isn't a lot of um, uh, comparison made between Byzantine law and, say, law of, in other parts of Eastern Christianity, so Syriac law, Armenian law, what have you. And I was just wondering, um, you know, from your perspective as a, as a practitioner of, of Byzantine legal scholarship, do you think the future of the discipline um, that we should address these Eastern legal traditions uh, more, so legal traditions that were in the Near East and related to the Byzantine legal tradition, or I mean, very open general question, and you know, you don't have to answer it, but yeah. where do you think the future of the um, the discipline is in that respect? Well, science never ends, so I mean, it really depends on on one's uh, aims and and uh, uh, research activities. Um, it is true. Personally, I'm more I'm more interested in in um, comparing Byzantine law to the Western tradition to, because uh, they both have a common legal ground, which is Roman law. I mean, they're both based in in Roman law, so it makes sense um, to compare them and and to see their interaction. Um, but uh, I, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm rather open to to um, studying, um, comparing also parts of Byzantine law with Islamic law. Uh, it's just that it's not my my my uh, main uh, 
well, not, not my main, but I haven't dealt with it, but I can imagine that other scholars who are uh, Islamicists and, and would like to reach out or compare, there's another, of course, of course, I'm open to that. And I have to say, now that you say it, uh, very recently, uh, there's a project between the University of Groningen and the University of Hamburg mm. uh, about um, oaths of loyalty in Roman, Byzantine and Islamicate uh, by, uh, legal spheres. Um, and the idea is, it's a one-year project that um, Islamicists, do I pronounce it well? Islamicists, yes. mainly from Hamburg, uh, and uh, legal scholars from Groningen will cooperate uh, for that. So that's something new for us. Um, maybe we'll learn from that. I hope so. But um, it's, I have to be honest, it's something new for me. Up to now, uh, my uh, interest, because I can speak for myself, is actually the Western legal tradition. Um, um, if I want to compare a Byzantine law, because again, they're, they're, they have a common ground, Roman law. And yeah, uh, I'm interested in Roman law, of course. But I'm, I'm really uh, curious to see what this project will come up with. So um, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open <laughs> and uh, uh, to learn from other disciplines. So let's see what will happen with that. Yeah. So thank you for your response. And I think with that, we can open up the floor to further questions. Oh, OK. Um, oh, we have a message that um, you can read the book if you visit the Animed library. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, electronically, even, yes. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Although I'm very happy about this. Where do I see this on the chat? Oh, uh, I'm very happy because. The book is rather expensive, <laughs> so uh, if if a library uh, is able to um, uh, have it, there's an ebook, and and it makes sense to, uh, to to have it also digitally. So that that's great. The because we want the book to be read, of course. So it's great if more libraries uh, uh, uh, can have it online. Yeah. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Well, well, maybe while people are thinking of questions, I can ask another question, uh, which you, you, Daphne, you brought up the the um, the relationship of Byzantine law and Roman law, mm -hmm. which is something that audience member Bernard Stolta, uh, welcome by the way, has also uh, published on. Um, I, I was wondering um, what you think uh, uh, people who are interested in Roman law can learn from Byzantine law, uh, because especially one thinks of the Scolius, um, uh, it's interesting to see how medieval, say, Byzantine jurists uh, interpreted late Roman law. I mean, most of what they're doing is looking at uh, the Corpus Juris Cubitus, as you said, um, and they're interpreting it in, then in their 11th, 12th century context, right, or later, earlier, later. Um, what, how, how is Byzantine law or your book useful um, to a Roman legal historian? Do you think? Yeah, that's a bit of I'm trying to think. <laughs> well, uh, our book is about Byzantine law. And of course, Byzantine law is Roman law, but in Greek, at least this is how it began. So it's not that a Romanist will, will learn about Roman law. That was not the aim of the book. But he can see how Roman law was developed uh, uh, in the eastern part. And if he's interested in that, he can learn about that. So uh, um, what is interesting is, and again, this, this book has a bit of snapshots of, of different sources. Since you mentioned the commentaries, there are some interesting um, new Basilica scholia, so comments of the 11th and 12th century of the, on the Basilica. And um, I think we, we, we certainly have some, but that was not the aim of the book to um, show that this kind of scholia. Um, in, in, in, a, in a detailed, in an, how do I say, in, in detail, but uh, there are some scholia, new scholia of 11th and 12th century that can actually um, be surprising for a Romanist uh, because they saw a rather um, sophisticated level uh, of Roman law, of, of knowledge of Roman law. Um, we have a few, but um, if a Romanist wants to learn about that, he has to read uh, the, the bibliography, which is at the end of the section. I mean, our book didn't have the aim to 
um, um, highlight that. Our aim had our book had as a, has a name to um, choose little fragments of different sources and make a timeline. Um, but he can uh, a romance can have some um, inspirations. Let's say he can he can be motivated to read some other literature on that. Yeah. So I'm very happy to see that we have our first question from the audience uh, uh, from Bernard Solta, who oh. is. Also, for those of you who don't know, he's he's a great expert uh, of Byzantine and uh, and Roman law. So, um, Professor Stolta, Bernard, would you like to state your question? Oh, he has to write it. Uh, or, oh, you can write it. Um, I, I, uh, or... I right. don't know. Can you hear can... me? Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure, but uh, I, I couldn't find the usual uh, symbol for uh, mute and unmute, but now it's now it's there. Um, no, I have not so much a question as a comment. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, a, a fact from the history of scholarship that interest in the Western tradition, from Western to tradition in Byzantine law, was in fact. Uh, trying to find new information about the Western Roman tradition. Because of the common, common ancestor uh, in Constantinople, the Corpus Julius. Uh, so uh, uh, if you look at, uh, say, the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, it's, it's more or less uh, uh, exclusively from that point of view that an interest was taken. Uh, even uh, someone like uh, Leon Clavius, uh, Leon Clau, who had a definite uh, interest in the Eastern European world, uh, published mainly a, from this point of view of what can we learn from Byzantium as for, for the, our knowledge of uh, the, the Roman legal texts. How can we uh, uh, improve our uh, text? Uh, and then uh, I think at the end of the day, it, it was a wider historical perspective uh, that, that, in their view, would benefit the explanation and the practical use of, of the Justinianic corpus. Uh, whether a Romanist, Romanist also can learn something from Byzantine law as an independent tradition is a different question. And I think that, that on, on the one hand, uh, our insight into Byzantine law as Byzantine uh, could benefit from a sort of emancipation from this exclusively Romanist interest. Uh, and on the, at the other end of the time scale, it, it could also uh, develop its, it, its potential as a, an independent Byzantine tradition if, um, uh, if, if we see it less as Greek, but uh, typically uh, the, uh, the modern state of Greece uh, and then the present day law. Although, of course, it's undeniable uh, the, uh, the case that, that modern Greek law has also benefited hugely from Byzantine law and therefore ultimately from uh, the, the, the Roman legal tradition. Um, uh, to answer an earlier question of, of you, Zachary, I, I can say that um, when I was younger and more ambitious, I also learned Coptic in order to understand uh, the uh, say the, the sixth, seventh, eighth uh, century tradition, and the documentary uh, evidence we have from uh, from that period, uh, and then the same question could be asked uh, to to other uh, parts of the the uh, Byzantine Empire at its, at its widest extension. So a lot is to be done. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yes, th thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, comments.
um, I I didn't know that you had uh, that you had learned Coptic in the past. That's uh, that's very interesting. As I even ventured to a, a one publication, but I never followed this up. It's, it's, it's never... uh, uh, uh, the, the ultimate dream, of course, is is to to find direct points of contact. Uh, now. Uh, uh, most of the evidence we have of the direct contact between, let's, let's say, Constantinople uh, and, uh, and and Egypt uh, in, in that period still was done in Greek. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it, the most interesting thing about uh, the, the Coptic legal language is how Greek it is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think we must assume that at least part of the Roman legal concepts has traveled that way into Coptic uh, Coptic law as well. I, I see that we have a um, a second question from the audience, so I will try and uh, fulfill my role here as moderator and allow this person to speak. So from um, Heidi Ray uh, Bidici. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for this uh, lovely organization. Uh, before I ask my question, I would like to report to there is, I think, a problem in the chat box. So the audience are not allowed to type their question in the chat box because it's disabled by the uh, oh. organization. Yeah. And right. after that answer my question. Yeah. After reporting this, so my question about the uh, marriage law uh, in late uh, Byzantine. So um, I wonder, do we have any legal documents or evidence regarding the surnames or religious affiliations, whether Catholic or Orthodox of Latin princesses and Byzantine princes or emperors post-marriage, according to Byzantine marriage law during the late Byzantine period? Uh, could you please suggest any sources for further research on this topic? Thank you very much. Um. I can't think of uh, directly of anything. Uh, I'm a bit surprised now because I, I was here about the book, so I haven't, uh, uh, but I can't think of something uh, directly on this. I don't know if Bernard can think of something, of Zachary. Um, mm. Yeah, I know that, um, well, in Greek, you have articles of uh, Papayani about Ma Byzantine marriage law, but for this, uh, the surnames, I, I can't, nothing rings a bell directly. In, so I'm no, sorry. I can't help either. Yeah. I'm afraid. This is um um so regarding marriage contracts in general, um, I'm trying to think of if if there are a examples of a, of say a complete marriage contract from the late period. Um, you know, speaking from the perspective of, of monastic archives, these these are this is a type of document that doesn't tend to get uh transmitted, right? As opposed to say transfer property or testament or something like that, something that a monastery would uh, would collect in its archive, a marriage contract. Now, I mean, I can think of, um, I mean, there is the very famous one, which is in uh, Latin, however, I believe, Theophanu, her marriage contract. Um, but otherwise, I think they're only cited um, in parts um, as a part of um, other legal disputes. Um, but I can't think of a full one off the top of my head, to be honest. I will have to get back to you. That's that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So I see Thank that you. now questions could be typed, I see. If there are. Ah, yes. Okay. Somebody has. All right. I'm glad that, um, that that's been allowed for us because I, I was trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and I don't know. So yes, if you would like to type a question, um, Please do so. In the meantime, perhaps I can say, because we referred to canon law, and I said that uh, there's a very small chapter on canon law in our book. Um, one of the reasons for that is that there are already two um, um, basic publication of Trojanos in English about canon law. Um, which actually they are uh, essentially they are English translations of the canon law sections of Trojanos Pies. Uh, these are published in the book, The History of Byzantine and Eastern Canon Law to 1500, a book published in 12, 
2012, edited by Hartman and Pennington. Uh, but the last years, there's a rather interest in, in, in canon law. Um, I refer to, um, there's a new critical edition of the commentary of Aristinos. There are the writings of uh, James Morton on South Italy. Uh, Harris Messis has also uh, uh, made a, a translation of uh, uh, um, comments of the Council of Trullo. So there's a, there's a kind of, I, I think there's rather an interest in canon law, in Byzantine canon law. Um, from more scholars. And maybe maybe that's something that uh, we can talk about briefly um, because it might not be well known to the audience, but um, the way canon law functioned in Byzantium was actually, you could say it was quite a bit different than what most people um, are familiar with from, say, the medieval West, where you have the law of the church and you have the law of the state, and they they have separate um, spheres of, of jurisdiction, as it were. Or that's a traditional narrative. I mean, there was obviously overlap um, in certain areas. But um, in Byzantium, from very early on, um, you have uh, emperors who, who legislate on matters of the church, right, on church property, monastic property, on... Um, uh, rules for priests, uh, so age of ordination, marriage law, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a there's more of a mix, and I think this is also discussed in your book, if I if I, I'm not mistaken, Daphne. But the idea of a normal canon. So this is something that I think appears what around the 11th century or so as a term in Byzantine law, and the idea is, is that it's a mixture of both secular nomoi nomi secular laws and church canones, so canons. And this is sort of often brought forth as a as an example of the intermeshing, as it were, of, of church and state in the Byzantine case. Yes, and we just referred to some basic uh, terms of canon law in the last chapter, and we make a brief overview. But as we stated in the beginning, there was not really a clear line between uh, state and church there was no separation in byzantium it all begins from that um so it was absolutely normal for the emperor to decide on on on ecclesiastical matters because it was a state affair so uh, uh it made sense because there was no separation between church and state um this is a general remark on how we begin the canon law but uh, uh i think um uh, well this is a big issue, <laughs> but uh, yes, in Byzantium, there was never a real clear distinction between, um, actually, maybe it's a bit fake to say secular and canon law, that, that there was always an interaction between both, which goes back to what I said, you couldn't really draw, uh, there was not a line, there was no separation between uh, uh, church and state in Byzantium. Bernard. Raises his hands. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the nice examples is the commentary of, of Balsamon uh, on the Normal Canon. Because in every single title of the Normal Canon, he uh, compares canon and civil law and then speaks about uh, moments where the two interfere uh, uh, without setting out a, a, a, a full theory on. on of, or a precedence of the of the two, but uh, it, it, it's uh, obvious from his commentary alone uh, that that in in practice the two were inseparable, and and in in, in fact in the Basilica uh, there uh, are uh, a number of titles uh, which in, in our modern eyes, at least, uh, are dealing with secular uh, sub with, with uh, uh, ecclesiastical subjects, and the the role of the emperor in the church uh, is is a special subject uh, on which much has been been written already. Yes. The uh, one classic image you have from Justinianic legislation is this idea of symphony of symphonia. Yep. The church and state cooperating, right, um, to resolve uh, legal matters, legal disputes. Um, yes, don't be shy, please. If you have any any questions, uh, we have 
we have Daphne for Nard Stolte here too <laughs> to answer questions. So yeah. Um, does anyone else have uh, any questions? Ah, Bernard Solta again, yes. Uh, well, it, I, I don't want to, to monopolize the stage. Uh, no, but, but uh, uh, I enjoyed seeing the book grow. That, that's what I want to say. And then uh, my compliments uh, to, to uh, Daphne and Roche. Uh, I I have read everything more than once, so... <laughs> yes, I, I, I, this is something that is mentioned I in the preface. I probably can say I'm thoroughly familiar uh, with the book, and I'm happy it's there. Uh, and that, uh, I, uh, I'm glad uh, that they have taken the trouble to do what I perhaps should have done earlier, but never mind. Well, you have things to do, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> The, about normal canon speaking, but I mean, no, this is something that we say in the preface, that's why I didn't, but it was very nice to have uh, an experienced colleague as Bernard to read the book uh, really and, and uh, bring, uh, for example, what we now mentioned about canon law, that was a remark by Bernard that, you know, you should say something about this in the beginning of the canon law section, about there was no separation, otherwise people would be upset. So there were all kinds of comments that helped into uh, making uh, this book uh, um, as it is now, which, and we are very thankful for that. You know that. Maybe just... that I, I, ha I have to leave the session. Yes. Uh, so, um, I... uh, thank you for joining, uh, Bernard. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's the first day of uh, August, traditionally a holiday. Yes. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nice to have this book presentation, yeah. especially on that date. Okay. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for us. So, who who else would like to throw their hat in the ring, as it were, with a with another question? And I can say, of course, we can finish the session if, if there are no questions. And if, if someone will have a question, I'm always, of course, available by email <laughs> like, uh, if, if, if you would like, uh, if you think of something, but to make it easier. Maybe, maybe I can ask a, another question uh, while people are thinking, um, which is uh, going back to the separation between, yeah, canon law and secular law in Byzantium, which, as you say, is not... A separation that we uh, is is really valid in, in Byzantium. Um, after a certain point, uh, so maybe Hagio Theodoritis, uh, you know your can your Scolius, mm -hmm. um, beginning with him, they, almost all prominent legal scholars in Byzantium are canonists, or they they have church offices, mm -hmm. um, and but yet at the same time they know secular law very well. Um, uh, why do you think that is, or uh, do you have an explanation as to why this um, sort of secular, uh, purely secular legal tradition uh, dies out? I mean, people like Eustathios Romeos or even Ateliatis at the end of the 11th century, um, you know, aren't canonists. Uh, but then after that, it's hard to find, um, say, secular legal uh, jurists, secular law jurists in Byzantium. After... I didn't understand your question. Well, it, it goes back to what we said that, okay, secular and canon law are together, but your question, Zachary, is after? what? Did sure, you but why in late Byzantium, why don't yeah. we have secular jurists? Ah, okay. Um, in late Byzantium, you mean <laughs> period, okay. Uh, okay, as you all know, the 12th century is the, the well, you have the, glor the glory of the canonists, so mm -hmm. uh, we have the three main uh, uh, canonists, which uh, um, and the church takes over a lot of. Uh, um, uh, there's a lot of jurisdiction that the church takes over. I mean, uh, we have uh, one example of Homatinos, for example, uh, in the book, 
um, the one of the, the archbishop of, of uh, in uh, Epirus. Um, so it also has to do with the structure of the Byzantine state. This is what I can say right now and not uh, go into detail, but we, you see that gradually that's something that, as I said, that we, this is how we began, that in the book we do not have fragments of later uh, sources, uh, but there is also the um, register of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. So it has to do with the structure of the Byzantine state, and we see that gradually there's more uh, influence of ecclesiastical courts because um, this is what uh, uh, survives. So it's something logical, I think. This is how I can answer the question uh, right now. Uh, but this is something that we do not do in the book. We, we as I said, we finish, we, we do uh, examine one decision of Homatinos. Well, not decision, just a fragment. Um, but we do not continue with, uh, with later, uh, uh, we do not include other fragments. Um, yes, thank you for that, um, for the answer. I think Bernard Sota, he still has his hand up, but as far as I know, he's left. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I any see. any further questions, comments? Daphne, is there anything that you would like to say? Um, well, no, but uh, Sakharov, I'd really like to thank you for your uh, questions and your the discussion. Uh, for bringing up a lot of stuff and making me think again uh, about things that I have uh, to do or left out or could be better. That's always nice. Uh, and of course, the organizers for this talk. I know that it's also being recorded, so perhaps people will see it afterwards. Uh, so that's nice about uh, the book. And of course, I want to thank uh, Ross Megering again, who is not with us, but for teaching me and and uh, and it's, and having fun with her all these years, because uh, this is also something that I say in the preface. It's a rather uh, difficult uh, subject, and it's really a pleasure to, to be uh, teaching this together with an experienced colleague uh, for the select few. It, we knew it was for the select few, but we had a lot of fun uh, doing that. And it's always nice uh, uh, learning and having fun as well. So uh, I, I, I, I, I would like to thank Rose for allow, allowing me to help this uh, her translations, which was the base of this book after all. And I, I think I will end with this observation. And of course, the uh, Bernard, which already uh, talked about him and his participation here, uh, which was also my antecessor in my PhD as well, since uh, he was here. Yeah. Maybe I could end uh, with a with a joke that actually Bernard Solta wrote in one of his articles. Yeah. Um, when the Basilica was completed, the new edition in 1988, I think, there was a special issue of um, uh, Subsevica Ronin uh, Ghana, right? Yeah, yeah. Writing its um, publication. Yeah. And he wrote that um, that on one of his exams, he asked what the Basilica were. Um, and a student wrote, the Basilica are what the citizens of Paris stormed on July 14th, uh, 1789. They were talking about the Bastille, the Bastille. Yes. Um, but I think with your book, um, more people in the world will know what these uh, what these Byzantine legal terms are, uh, that they won't confuse the Bastille and the um, and the Basilica. Yeah. And uh, you, again, congratulations on a great book. It's Thank a major you. achievement, and uh, yeah, it will be used in courses uh, on Byzantine law. I'm sure introductory courses. So thank you oh. from my side as well. Thank you. I hope so. That's the idea to raise interest about Byzantine law. And I, I think that the article you refer to, just to correct, it was by Jan Lokin, not Stolte, but it was in the Subsexiva Chronigana, which uh, Bernard's also the editor and was in this big congress. Yeah. I, I stand corrected. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we pass the word to the organizer, I yes. think. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of uh, you, for this wonderful talk and uh, moderation, Zachary. And uh, dear listener, thank you for your questions and contributions. They were very valuable for us. Uh, Anamed Library Talks uh, will continue in September with Celso Castro. Uh, we will be uh, sharing the details on, on the following days. Uh, so I'd like to uh, say good evening to all. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Bye bye. İyi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar. <gülüyor> Teşekkürler. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.